Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 113, recorded on July 7th, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. Good to be connected with you. We kick off today's show with a couple of really important releases, starting with Debian 10 Buster. Yeah, this is 25 months in development, and it's going to be supported for five years as well. So this is a pretty big deal. Yeah, Buster ships with several desktop applications and environments ready to go. Cinnamon 3.8, GNOME 3.30, Plasma 5.14, of course, Joe's favorite, XSCE 4.12, Mate 1.20, as well as LXQ 14 and LXDE 0.99.2. But we default to GNOME with Buster, and that is now on top of Wayland instead of Xorg. Yeah, which is kind of surprising, because Debian is traditionally very conservative, but if even Debian think that Wayland is ready for mainstream, then what does that tell you? Is X just dead, finally? <laughs> I don't know, man, because I installed the XFCE edition uh, when I tried out Buster, and so I was using Xorg. <laughs> so it's not dead for me. I actually gave um, two different goes at uh, Debian 10. They have the live ISOs you can download, which are full live environments in a DVD. I, I grabbed, obviously, the XFCE one, but they have other others. And then they have the net installs. I chose to try out Buster using both install methods. Did you get a chance to try it? Yeah, I went for the network install, and it was a bit fiddly because I had to get the the blob for my wireless card. But once I sorted that out, it was just plain sailing, really, super quick, and just Debian. I mean, that's the thing. It's not massively different from the last one, is it? It's just updated and just Debian. There's a couple of notable differences I'll touch on here in a second, but for my ex- install experiences... I'm going to recommend people use the net install. You get a graphical installer either way. The one in the live environment is laid out slightly different than the graphical one for the net install, but it's perfectly functional, and it boots right into that graphical net installer right away. So that's definitely the way to go. And then you can choose your desktop and all that stuff. But okay, Joe, here's a couple of the things that are different since version 9. For those of you that are in a security focused environment, App Armor, which is mandatory access controls for restricting programs capabilities, is now installed and enabled by default. Also, thanks to the reproducible builds project, over 91% of the source packages in Debian 10 will build bit for bit identically to the binary packages, which is, as you know, a very important feature to verify the source, and to protect against, say, malicious attempts to tamper with software in between the original source and the end user. Yeah, and it also has Secure Boot this time around. Yeah, and a total of 10 architectures are now support. Not all of them support Secure Boot, but Debian itself now supports 10 total architectures. Yeah, it really is the universal operating system. But what I meant by it being the same old Debian is, although there's been some pretty major changes with that security stuff, the actual end user experience hasn't changed much at all really and i see that as good if you are familiar with debian and how it all works the installer is the same the the end product is well the gnome that i had was just basically just stock gnome 3.30 it feels just like debian i also tried out the mate edition which is perfectly fine and functional and the xfce edition does have edwadia dark installed by default and i I, my walk away impression from that was this is the perfect desktop for joe because it's going to be supported for five years and when they do an upgrade you just get exactly what you expect and with someone like yourself who runs a desktop that isn't updated super frequently you pair that with a base operating system like debian i'm not clear on why you're not using this as your daily driver actually and you're not a big gamer either, so like some of the uh, gaming polls to Ubuntu aren't there for you. Well, I think what it is, right now, I could happily use Debian 10 Buster, no problem. But in a few years, it starts to feel a bit, even for me, a bit old and stale. Some of the applications just get left behind and new features come along that I actually want. And it, for me, upgrading every couple of years with Ubuntu, a few months kind of behind the release, that feels like a good cadence for me. And I can cope with, say, two, two two-and-a-half-year-old software. But then I need to upgrade. I suppose I could do that with Debian as well. But I don't know, I'm just kind of stuck in this Ubuntu rut now. And, well, it's not even a rut. I'm, I'm happily in that rut, if you know what I mean. And so I just don't really feel the need to change. But I, I could happily use Debian if Ubuntu just disappeared overnight. 
Another way to put rut is you found a, a really good workflow that's just working perfectly fine for you and you have no reason to toss the whole thing up in the air on a lark. <laughs> I get yeah. that. Yeah, I get that. Although I'm interested that um, I didn't try out the XFCE version because traditionally it's just been a very stock XFCE, which is really ugly. So I do need to check it out if they've actually themed it nicely this time. Oh, no, not by default, no. Oh, right, right, right. No, it's quite ugly. It's quite ugly. But it takes only just a few moments to, to tweak it. Right. I yeah. guess your point, though, is taken when you said that it's almost too far on that slow spectrum. And you could jump on that upgrade cycle when, like, the new, when, say, when Debian 11 ships. But Ubuntu does sort of have that sweet spot for you where you get a lot of those advantages. But if you need to pull in a PPA or a snap for that, like, one thing, like, say, Telegram or, or Firefox that you want super current, because as an example, Debian 10 ships with the ESR version of Firefox. And that could be a great use case of you probably want the most current version of Firefox if possible, where you do strike that balance with Ubuntu. And that, in part, is why Fedora has worked so well for me, because it's even further up on that scale, but it's not at the arch level. It's curated still, it's release-based, but it's very current packaging, very clean system. And so for me, Fedora has been that sort of perfect spot on the package current spectrum. And I can see where, for you, Ubuntu's a little bit further down, and then Debian's much, much further down on that spectrum. Yeah, well, you could argue that Ubuntu interim releases are similar to Fedora in that way, but I'm kind of Ubuntu LTS, and we've been kind of talking about it like as if ignoring the interim releases. But yeah, I, I could happily recommend Fedora or, at the moment, 1904 Ubuntu to some people, but I'm just that bit more conservative. But yeah, Debian, I think, is just too conservative for me. But I can see some people who I would highly recommend it for, and I know a bunch of people do use it happily. Yeah, especially um, the people that I'm thinking of like all of the things about Debian that maybe others might not like. They like the slow pace. They they like the simple rate of change. Uh, there's a school district nearby here that has workstations that are set up on Debian with XFCE, and for the most part, they, those systems have gone unchanged for nearly a decade now. They've kept upgrading them, but there's been no massive change to the staff's workflow in nearly a decade. These systems are so old, but yet, you know, they're just barely under that 64-bit line or across that 64-bit line, so you could just keep keep going at it until they die. And that's how they treat them at the school districts. And for them, XFCE on Debian has been the go-to stack now for for that entire time. And I don't think they're complaining yet. Things could change for Debian when it comes to how they handle code names in the future. This is not really related to the release of Debian, but we'll have a link in the show notes. If, if, you, if you're familiar with Debian's um, sources.list file, where it pulls down its different packages from different sources, there's always kind of been a, a naming scheme in there for stable or testing. And there's discussions right now about maybe tweaking that to be specific to a, a release or or maybe a date-based thing, and it's evolving into a much larger conversation. LWN, as always, has a fantastic write-up that, if you're interested, we'll have a link in the show notes. Yeah, and I was reading through that, agreeing with a lot of it, so yeah, highly recommended. Yeah, me too. I was like, you know what? As somebody who tangentially uses Debian, I am so in this line of thinking. Now, for those of you on Chromebooks, there's been a really important release for you this week. Yeah, Gallium OS 3.0 has been released, and I've been waiting for this for a long time. I've got an old C720, the Acer Chromebook, which is a perfectly functional laptop. And that was stuck on the old version of Gallium OS 2.0, which was based on Ubuntu, well, Zubuntu really, 16.04. And now we've finally got an 18.04 version. And so I have upgraded to that. Well, I actually did it just a new compare, it was just easier. And well, a bit like Debian, it's not really changed much. It is just based on 1804 now and otherwise works really well. Yeah, they really kind of build themselves as doing a lot of work under the hood. So the desktop environment, they pitch as an attractive full-featured desktop, which is based around XFCE, surprisingly. But it's under the hood that matters. They have a touchpad driver optimized for Chromebooks, kernel schedulers that are optimized for the type of CPU in Chromebooks, and they have SSD patches for particular types of Chrome devices that need them that other distros don't have. And then they have, quote, fixes for dozens of device-specific bugs, end quote, all while requiring less memory and disk space than a typical Linux distro install. So it's pretty competitive for these devices. And there's so many of these, like the one you have and many, many, many more out there. They have a ton of devices that they support, link in the show notes. And you can try it out in a live environment. 
And you can also dual boot. So you don't even have to nuke Chrome OS if you don't want. Yeah, and you can pick up some of these older Chromebooks for next to nothing now. And my one's only got two gigabytes of RAM, so it's kind of a bit limited. But if you look inside it, it's almost all battery. And the battery life, mine has started to fade now. But when I first picked it up secondhand, pretty cheap. I I think I paid about £80 for it or something. Wow. The battery life was amazing. It was just a perfect little media machine and browsing machine. Yeah, like seven hours. I had one too. I got like seven hours out of it. Yeah, exactly, which is like premium laptop style. And if all you're doing is a bit of web browsing and stuff, but you want that extra kind of functionality that you get with proper GNU slash Linux rather than Chrome OS, then Gallium OS is just a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. So it's great to see that the project is still going and still releasing. Absolutely. I'll just add, it makes for a great homework workstation because you can get actual LibreOffice on this thing. And yeah, it's getting there now with Chromebooks and Chrome OS, but this is the real deal. So we'll have a link there. Check it out because it's so lightweight. They're so inexpensive that if you've got kids and you're worried about them damaging the machine, this is um, this is a little bit safer on the pocketbook. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to swallow when an $80 Chromebook uh, gets destroyed versus like a $900 laptop. Well, I suppose regardless of which laptop you use, you probably, if you're listening to this show, like to stay current with the news. And Mozilla has a new service that they're hoping will pique your interest. Yeah, the first I heard about this was in our Slack when Drew from our team posted that he had seen this pop up and offer this $5 a month ad-free news subscription. But then when you actually click through, it turns out that they haven't launched it yet and they're just trying to gauge interest with a survey. But it seems that this popped up for quite a few people because it certainly did the rounds uh, in the tech press. Yeah, this comes not long after Apple began offering Apple News Plus, which is $10 per month. And I think others are working on similar solutions. It appears Mozilla is working with Scroll. Scroll is still in beta. It doesn't even have open signups yet. But the company says it offers an ad-free access to a variety of websites, including BuzzFeed, Slate, Gizmodo, Media Group Properties, and Vox Media Sites. And I think they, they kind of pitch to this particular news service is not only do you get ad-free access to the news sites, but the service will actually read the news. Like they have a supposedly human sounding voice that reads the news to you and supports cross-platform syncing of the news articles that you've read. That's their value pitch. And Mozilla would probably white label this is the assumption and offer it as part of their overall bundling. I have a lot of thoughts on this, Joe, but I am kind of curious to know what your first takes are. Well, my first thought was, ah, so they're going to add this to the VPN thing as well then. So we're slowly starting to see this drip feed of the services, plural, that they're going to offer. And as for news, I don't know really. I think that $5 a month is not very much, but how much do you actually get for that? Whereas you compare it with Apple, which is what, $10 a month, and you get a whole bunch more. You get magazine subscriptions, essentially, which um, I've actually found to be valuable. I, I subscribe to Linux Format, uh, Outsider, Car and Driver, and a couple of other magazines now that I never would have read if uh, there wasn't for some way to, for me to do it on a, on a display that is super high resolution and it makes it really lazy to push a button. I, I might do the same for Mozilla's and drop Apple's if it was competitive, but part of me at the same time has has questions about really trying to monetize news as a service that feels dirty to me and also feels unnecessary because there's so many ways to get news between aggregators, Google's news site, Twitter, all of the established news outlets that have been around for 10, 20, 30 years. Like there's so many ways to get news. Who's like, oh man, I wish somebody would just put all this together in one spot for me. Like really? That's what an RSS reader does. It's just obviously not for our audience, I don't think, because also podcasts are are a great way to digest important news. And it's an established medium that's obviously successful. I guess I would give it a go, but I'm a bit of a news hound because of our line of work. I would take issue with that it feels dirty to try and monetize news because it's being monetized by tracking and adverts at the moment. And surely a subscription service is a way better way to do it. Yeah, fair point. I I guess really that comment comes from some sort of idealist news should be a loss. It should be something you do as a public service. Um, you know, like we've taken dramatic efforts to take advertising out of this show. Like this is an ad-free show. I think it's important 
but I, I appreciate that it's just not possible as somebody who has also been on the other side of that. I, I understand. And Mozilla would be a trusted source, and your point's taken. I would prefer it over tracking. Did you also see, though, that uh, a little another little bit of information? It, we got kind of some brand name now for the uh, Firefox VPN service. Yeah, Firefox Private Network, FPN. It's a bit like a VPN, eh? Yeah, and they appear to be teasing three different price tiers right now, $5, $10, or $13 per month. There's been some ads online and in a podcast I listened to, Radio Lab. They recently had an ad for the new Firefox services. It never even mentioned the fact that Firefox was a web browser. I think I might dig that clip up and play it in this week's Linux Unplugged if I can find it. Because it was, it was like a surreal moment. I'm hearing an ad for Firefox on a podcast, and it's nothing about, nothing about what Firefox does. <laughs> so they're really making a fast pivot. Before they've even got everything lined up, before everything's done and finalized, they're already advertising the service. They're trying to move quick on this. And hearing that ad in that podcast, it struck me. Not only was it, again, nothing about what Firefox actually does, but it was advertising something that does not exist. It's not yet done. In fact, it's not even complete. They don't have final pricing. They don't even have the the whole thing put together yet, but they're already advertising it. That, to me, indicates that they're trying to move really quick, and they're in probably a very calculated way, putting the cart before the horse and deciding we got to get out there on the messaging and start this rebranding, start talking about this even before everything's lined up. I, I think that's really fascinating. It is a very aggressive approach. And I wonder if it will backfire on them because my rule of thumb, and okay, I'm not the greatest marketer in the world, but my rule is do the thing, then talk about the thing, or at least have it ready to go. If you start building too much hype too soon, then it could potentially be a letdown. Whereas if it's like, hey, here's this service, have at it, then it, it feels like harder to disappoint people that way. I can see that. I think maybe it's about maybe it's about like steering a brand into a new direction that's been known for one thing for so long. And they feel like to get people to see it as something else, it's going to take years, so might as well get started now. Maybe that's it. Or maybe there's something they're trying to get out ahead of. Maybe some some source of, this is all speculation, who knows, but maybe some source of income or who knows, who knows, they just, they seem like they're trying to get ahead of this thing in a big way. I'm kind of really fascinated to see how they pull it off. And there's like, there's hints of maybe this is something that could really work for me, but their timing's a little bad too, to be honest with you. Like they needed to do this two years ago. Yeah, or maybe a year ago when people started to really wake up to privacy and tracking and stuff and, and VPNs really took off. So it does feel a little bit late, but if they do it correctly, they do have that brand power that maybe it'll take off, but yeah, it'll be very interesting to see it. But meanwhile, this week, they were called out, Mozilla, as a villain by the ISPA, which is an industry body that represents ISPs in the UK. And uh, this is some serious, serious Streisand effect. This is great because Mozilla is a bad guy because they're introducing a way to bypass government filtering. So they're not a bad guy because they're doing monitoring and filtering and spying. They're a bad guy because they're creating tools to undermine filtering and monitoring. <laughs> and it's all because of the children, Joe. So this is from the Internet Services Providers Association. And they write on their site, unironically, they are pleased to announce the finalist for the 2019 Internet Hero and Villain Awards. And this is following, they write, weeks of consultation and large range of nominations received via email and Twitter from the public. Well, <laughs> I'm satisfied, Joe. <laughs> it's interesting that they put Mozilla alongside Article 13 and President Donald Trump. I better not say anything about the last one, but I think we can all agree that uh, Article 13 was something of a misstep by the European Commission. So it's just weird. But I think this has really just shone a light on the fact that Mozilla is introducing DNS over HTTPS, something that probably not that many people knew about and people will be looking into now and finding guides on how to enable it and so it's just spectacularly backfired for the ISPA. It has. And what's great is they've been called out on it, and then they've doubled down on it. 
and they just sound ridiculous. They, they sound like fear mongers. They write, the debate over DNS over HTTPS is evidently a topic that polarizes opinion, a.k.a. people are disagreeing with us. However, our position is clear. The ISPA believes that bringing in DNS over HTTPS by default would be harmful for online safety, cybersecurity, and consumer choice. They, they never actually say how or why, although we can speculate that the filtering is online safety and cybersecurity is the monitoring aspect that it's preventing. In a nutshell, what HTTP over DNS is, or DOH, D-O-H is sem- simply sending your DNS requests over HTTPS at the application level to a predefined host. That's the technology. Traditionally, the applications you use that look up a name online, as you likely know, are using your system's DNS. And that's configured in most home cases to be your ISP or whatever your corporate server is, et cetera, et cetera. But with DNS over HTTPS, it's controlled at the application level. So Firefox could be using an entirely different DNS server than Chrome is using which is also building support for DNS over HTTPS. Because it's at the application level, it can be baked in or it can be user-defined. It all depends on the application. As a complete aside, it's funny that the ISPA site is so bad. Not only have they not specified a background color, so you've got gray text on a gray background for me with my weird Firefox profile that's messed up, but also you've got this really annoying pop-up about cookies that you just can't get rid of. And on a desktop, it's not too bad. But on my phone, it took up a major part of the screen. And uh, it was just infuriating. Normally, okay, they pop up, they're annoying. You click yes, go away, whatever. But this just wouldn't let you get rid of it. So, uh, so annoying. I'm pretty sure we're going to dig more into uh, DNS over HTTPS because we've been experimenting a little bit. I'll just say members on our team have come up with ways to use DNS over HTTPS to, say, get internet access while on a plane without having to pay for the extremely expensive internet service. The the way uh, DOH hides DNS queries inside regular HTTPS traffic means that third-party observers are unable to sniff that traffic and tell what the DNS queries are, where they're going, et cetera, and redirect them or capture them or et cetera, or even just monitor them, right? It's, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in DNS. It's over plain text. It's something that's easily intercepted. It's something that's easily observed. This changes all of that. That's the advantage. The downside is it all comes to the implementation. It could be very easy to have every Firefox user's DNS over HTTPS traffic all going to Cloudflare, and now Cloudflare has got millions and millions of Firefox users' data, uh, at least for their DNS queries. So there are downsides, but how it's implemented is separate from how the technology actually works, because you could set up your own proxy on a VPS somewhere and just use it yourself. That's what we've been doing internally for testing. Yeah, I was going to mention Cloudflare. That is unfortunate, and it's, to be honest, what I thought this was about at first, that they were pointing that, oh, they're putting it all through Cloudflare. But no, they don't even care about that. It's just the fact that Mozilla are potentially helping people get around blocks. But Mozilla have said that they're not implementing it by default anyway. So it's just something that users can do if they want to. But um, yeah, we're going to have, definitely have to talk more about this uh, plane situation because I've got a couple of plane flights coming up where that'll be very useful to me. Yes, it is super, super useful when you've got something urgent, you just need to send off a message. And you know it's capable, but they're just they're they're blocking it some way artificially. I think also what Mozilla's statement was is that DNS over HTTPS would not be enabled by default in the UK. Now that might mean everywhere, but the spokesperson for Mozilla specifically said would not be enabled in the UK. It may still happen here in the US. And Google's also a big proponent of this. They I, they see it as a way to bypass filtering and restrictions and and get more people onto their services. So Google's really into this, and Mozilla sees it as a way to prevent censorship and filtering. So both browsers are, seem to be really near implementation, and it's it's not clear which will be on by default and which won't. Well, I have a feeling I might well be implementing it at some point in the future. Yeah, I want to implement my own, but I'm not necessarily keen on a lot of applications doing this, because this isn't just a web browser technology. Any application could do this. Telegram could bake this in, Skype... 
And there is a reason to have system-level DNS and network-level DNS. There's benefits to every application on your system talking to the same name resolution servers. It could get wonky for end users and produce unexpected results when maybe half your applications are talking to different DNS servers. Mm. I know they have ways to build in some accommodations for that, but like Firefox is a pretty solid accommodation system for that very scenario, and it's still not perfect. It does feel like early days for this, but it seems to be inevitable that this is the way we're all going to go. And I'm sure that these problems will get ironed out one way or another. You know what else is inevitable is I still feel like the fuchsia bomb is inevitable. And this week, that just got turned up like a whole nother notch, Joe. I'm, I'm legitimately concerned about fuchsia. Yeah, this is Google's alternative OS that they've very seldom spoken about. We've heard little snippets here and there, and mostly the code has done the talking. It's been in public repos, and it's permissively licensed and essentially an alternative to Linux. Right. The public first found out about Fuchsia in August of 2016 when they dumped a whole bunch of code. They just threw a whole bunch of code over the wall on GitHub. And everything that we know about it really is either from a couple of statements by Google engineers, some early on that were incredibly in-depth, um, and others that have been in like Google I.O., Keynotes, and whatnot. But when you look at the actual source code, it sort of does all of the talking. It is clear that there is a lot being built here to make it the next generation Android with all kinds of devices. Google will kind of talk about it as an IoT operating system, but so much of the tech in this is built for creating great desktop experiences. And when you look at the fact that one of their target devices is an Intel NUC, which is a desktop device, uh, that doesn't seem like an IoT thing. Yeah, this is clearly about more than just IoT and more than just phones and desktops even. And so now you can go to fuchsia.dev and actually learn a fair bit about it. They haven't specified a background color for a part of it, so I'm annoyed about that. But apart from that, it is a good resource to kind of see where they want to go with this. And if they're going to continue to do this Android-style throw it over the wall, it means they're going to be in control of it, potentially forever, or at least have significant control over it. So the topic of Fuchsia really almost deserves its own dedicated show because there's so much going on here. Because there's a lot happening around Fuchsia that makes it viable down the road. For example, the adoption of Go and Flutter are technologies that are at home on Fuchsia. And when Fuchsia launches as a, as a general available OS, these developers will be ready to pick up and get going. In fact, Fuchsia also supports running Python and Rust as well as a bunch of other languages. But one of the really strong appeals to it is this process model where essentially everything is isolated. You can do away with containers now because it's just integrated into the way the operating system works. Even the file systems themselves live entirely within user space. They're not linked or loaded to the kernel. They're just simply user space processes that can be implemented as servers that other processes can then attach to. And they talk about, you can, you can do total modifications of these file systems, and it's just a matter of killing a process and relaunching them. Forget rebooting your operating system. And then, then you have the GPU driver architecture, which is called Magma. And these are also drivers that do not execute inside the kernel. But again, user space processes. And Magma's designed around Vulkan. And so you've got a lot of modern technologies that are kind of, in a way, it, it's like Google looked at all of the mistakes and compromises they made with Android and Chrome OS and said to themselves, if we took every lesson we learned and built a new operating system where we controlled it completely, even if it's open source, they, they're, they're still doing the over-the-wall approach, and we build up an entire ecosystem around Go and Flutter and Dart I mean, they support Python on the damn thing. Like, it's ready to go almost. It's so close. And this new website is loaded full of documents that we have a researcher pouring through right now to try to learn as much as we can. But there is more and more signs that Google is relatively far along with Fuchsia, and we don't have a lot of details yet. But one thing that stands out to me is a clear user interface that would be great on, like, a mobile device is this thing they call Stories which is a user-facing, logical container encapsulating human activity satisfied by one or more related modules. Stories allow the users to organize activities in ways they find natural. Stories are presented in a visual thing called a story shell. It's Microsoft's timeline feature 
but in this whole shell around, based around your, your activity and your timeline, and they call it story. That's not for IoT devices. Give me a break. No, that is clearly aimed at mobile and maybe kind of home assistants and stuff, which I suppose technically are IoT, but we're not talking about the low-end thermostats and stuff like that. You said that it's as if they looked at the mistakes they made with Chrome OS and Android, but it's almost like they've taken a, an even bigger step back and looked at the mistakes of Unix and Linux and everything that we've known, really, for the last, like, 40-odd years. Yeah. And uh, are thinking about how to just re-implement it all completely from scratch with modern technologies and ideas, design ideas. There's also some fundamental differences in design philosophy, which kind of really puts Fuchsia opposite to Linux. And it, it, A, it's permissively licensed, which is going to make driver manufacturers very happy because they don't have to worry about, quote, GPL contamination, end quote. But there's the design of the kernel itself. Fuchsia is a microkernel, and Linux is a monolithic kernel. And this is an age-old debate that goes back, like, forever in the industry. And we're going to see these two things he compete head-to-head -head on the world stage. And then, of course, last but not least, Fuchsia will be controlled by Google with an ecosystem around it that it cultivates, like Go and Flutter and Kubernetes and all of these things that make it applicable on mobile and server, against Linux, which is developed by the entire world and not owned by a single person or controlled by a single company. And it's going to be, on all these different fronts, totally different approaches going head-to-head, -head, potentially when Fuchsia launches. And it really does seem close. Like, they've been working on this for a long time. They're getting close. And what they do with it... We have yet to see. They've been downplaying what they what they just say it's a it's an experimental operating system, but they've invested so much tech into this. It seems it's clearly more than that. Yeah, it's potentially quite worrying, really, that they could use their vast resources. Even spending a few hundred million on it wouldn't be that much to them. I mean, it's a bit more than pocket change, but it's still not very much. And what could you accomplish with that? And maybe they could just take over the world like Linux has. I mean, it might take them a little while, five, 10 plus years, but we could be in a situation in another decade where Linux is sort of playing second fiddle. I mean, look what happened with Firefox. Okay, that's a much smaller bit of software, relatively speaking, but Firefox was going strong and looking like it was going to take over. And then suddenly Google comes along with the resources that they have to make Chrome and it just basically has wiped out Firefox. And what if that same thing happened with Linux and we ended up having this Android-style operating system that's just thrown over the wall and, yes, is open source, but fundamentally is just controlled by one giant company? It, it makes me a bit uncomfortable, really. To truly disrupt Linux, you just have to disrupt it on the server. I mean, I just toss that out there nonchalantly. I mean, that's a huge statement. But let's go with where you're, where you're taking this for a moment. That there's some things about Fuchsia that I think are super appealing. First of all, Google has a clear demand for an efficient operating system, even if it's just in their data center. It's sort of that, that same reason I just tossed Kubernetes under a, the bus a moment ago. It's The reason that makes Kubernetes kind of appealing to people is Google has every incentive to make it work great for them if, it, if only they ever used it internally. And that kind of inherently makes it a great product because they're, they're at such scale that they're solving problems people need solved. Fuchsia would provide them that same sort of utility. They could take Linux off of their own servers and put Fuchsia on there, and they would grok the benefits of reducing the complexity now because you just get rid of things like namespaces and control groups, and Docker as a concept goes away because every application is protected and isolated, and even the file systems are protected and isolated. Like it's, it's really well designed for dense application servers that could run even more applications than we can now because you get rid of all these middle layers that make it possible and make them isolated. That right there could be enough to drive the market because that gets them more density out of their existing data center footprint, and if the operating system's free, it's pretty hard to turn down. If they make it easy enough to run Linux applications, it could be a slam dunk. Now, that's, that's a far, yeah, that's a far, far, far maybe. I've yet to see anything really take Linux out. And most of the time, what ends up happening is Linux adapts, incorporates the best, and continues on. In this one case, because of who Google is, their market position, and the way they're building this, 
Yeah, yeah, it worries me. Yep, it definitely. If this Fuchsia worries me. 10 times more than the Windows subsystem for Linux does on Windows 10. Way, way more. What this is represents a much bigger threat to me than anything that Microsoft is doing right now. There is another distinct possibility, though, and that is that Google will just do what they always do and spend a load of money developing something for ages and ages and then just drop it. Absolutely. And that's what I'm hoping for. (laughs) That's what I'm betting on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, be sure to grab every single episode of Linux Action News. Go over to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get our new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And I want to mention that Linux Academy is hiring multiple positions, including Ruby on Rails developers, instructors, and many more. Go to linuxacademy.com, scroll all the way down at the bottom of the page, click careers, and it'll link you there. A lot of these positions are full-time, remote, with full benefits. Come work with us. That'd be pretty awesome. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Resington. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later.